like, first of all, to respond to the words of welcome. Uh, it is a pleasure, always has been. And as long as the Lord enables us, and should you be kind enough to invite us back again, it always will be a pleasure to join with you around the Word of God. We may be small in number, but that is really of no significance as far as the importance of a gathering of this nature is. We seek to hold aloft in a dark age the truth of God as set forth in the scriptures regarding the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am of the opinion that eventually, in God's time, the truly redeemed people of God will become aware of the importance of these truths, even though I think that we are at a stage in the experience of the Church of Christ that is set forth in Matthew 25, where the church is represented by the wise and the foolish, slumbered and slept those who were truly the Lord's and those who weren't truly the Lord's, they all slumbered and slept. And there is a spirit of indifference today regarding the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It can be put no other way, a spirit of indifference. But I believe that it will please the Lord to awaken his people until there is across the world a people like Simeon of old who have had it brought home to their hearts that God is about to fulfill his promises. With Simeon it was the first coming but there will be a repeat of that I believe amongst the people of God so that an awakened church will be watching and waiting on those final days. And it's our job, I believe, to keep the torch held up and be the means under God to awaken the believer to the truths set forth in this book. It's a privilege, brethren and sisters, to be in possession to some degree, and none of us, I'm sure, would boast of the degree of understanding that we have concerning prophetic truth, but nevertheless, to possess to some degree an understanding of what is set forth in Scripture regarding the coming again of Christ. What a privilege that is. It doesn't drive us to despise those who don't seem to be aware of these truths, but rather it causes us to desire, both by prayer and by our witness here, to see them awakened. And there's none of us but can remember, surely, a time when we didn't understand these things. And God graciously opened our eyes, opened our hearts, and now we rejoice in these wonderful truths set forth in Scripture. Now, having said that, I very, very quickly, because I was hoping Mr. Tom would do this. I'm never a good advertiser of anything that has come from my hand, but... I've brought along just a few, six copies, of a publication we have just put out. We didn't intend to print it. Uh, 
we were content just to do a digital form and put it up on our website. It is a record of a wonderful time in the experience of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster. Fifty years ago, and strange to relate, it was sparked off, most unusually, by a series of incidents that resulted in the imprisonment of three ministers, two of whom have gone to be with the Lord. Dr. Ian Paisley, the Reverend John Wiley, and myself. I was but a student back then. And we ended up in prison. <clears throat> and it wasn't really as a result of who we were or what we did or anything else. But God was pleased to use that incident to awaken a tremendous interest in the gospel. In the gospel, not in a political matters, not in uh, any other form of national considerations that may have gripped the hearts of the people, but it was a spiritual awakening. And it stemmed, as I say, from the incidents that resulted in us going to jail. And here we have in this publication records taken from the church magazine of the Free Presbyterian Church in that day. It's not my writing really at all. I have a bit of an introduction and that sort of but the most of it, 95% of it, is from the old magazine, the church magazine, The Revivalist, in which accounts are given of gospel missions, churches being formed, congregations being planted, God's people being separated from the ecumenical movement, really a time of spiritual blessing. And dare I say, it really was a time of revival. There are some 30,000 words in this uh, publication. I think that if you know nothing of that period, you will find it interesting. If you remember something of that period, you will find it even more interesting. I, when I put it together, I, I, I have to say, I heard again the voice of, a man I loved greatly in the Lord, Ian Paisley. A man that was, in those days, a man of God, a man of power. And as I put together these articles, I heard his voice again. And I walked with him again as I recalled the times together 50 years ago. I'll commend it to you. It's five pounds, and uh, there's some copies over there. Let's turn now, please, to the Word of God. Exodus chapter 1 has been read to us, and there we have introduced the spirit of anti-Christianity that was at work back in the days of Pharaoh. And tonight our subject is Pharaoh, a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. But before we say any more, I'd like us just to bow in a brief word of prayer. Would you please join me in prayer? O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we come now to this most solemn task. We don't believe, Lord, that ever man had a more solemn and more sacred task to perform than proclaiming the word of God. And Lord, how unfitted we are by nature. How unworthy we are. Oh God, help us tonight. Help us tonight, Lord Jesus. Bring to our minds those things that need to be said. 
And Lord, may we traverse the word of God and set forth thy truth in this matter. May we see the Lord Jesus. May we see his overruling providence. May we see his sovereignty. May we see his glory. May we see his wisdom. May we see his ultimate victory portrayed before us. Come and bless us then tonight and help me. I ask it in the Savior's name. Amen. 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 that there should be a series of subjects dealt with at the present time in which various men who foreshadowed the Antichrist are being studied, at least what God has been pleased to record record, uh, regarding them, is something that should remind us of certain important truths. There have been men in this world who, above all other men, bore a likeness to that personage, God says, will be raised up by the devil at the end of this age just prior to the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that there have been men who have borne a likeness to the Antichrist ought to drive home to us the truth that the spirit of iniquity, the spirit of rebellion, that we are more and more conscious of in these evil days, has been at work ever since the days of Adam. We should look at what happened to Adam and what the devil sought to accomplish through Adam as but the devil striving to do that which he has striven to accomplish throughout the ages but has been hindered by God and will continue to be hindered by God until God's time comes. What happened in the Garden of Eden was, as it were, a rehearsal. It was the devil pushing at the boundaries God had imposed upon him and his attempting to set up that which at a future time, maybe not that far away, God will allow him to set up. So we should should see the link between the first recorded incident of the devil's rebellion and his involving of a man in that rebellion against God. We should see the link between that and all the other occasions in which the devil tried to do the same Right until in the future, he will, by God's providence, be permitted to raise up a man who will be called the Antichrist. That there have been many attempts by the devil to promote his cause through men and that we should find in the records of Holy Scripture, those who are foreshadows of the Antichrist, remind us also of the constraint that God exercises upon the devil. 
Now we're looking tonight at Pharaoh. I'm sure, and I think I'm right in this, I'm sure that if the devil had had his way, he would have made Pharaoh the Antichrist. But because of the constraints that God imposed upon the devil, the devil was only able to promote in Pharaoh some of the likenesses of the Antichrist. He wasn't able to develop his plan to its fullness. Otherwise, we wouldn't be looking at Pharaoh as a foreshadowing. We would be looking at Pharaoh as the Antichrist. God exercises this restraint upon the powers of darkness. Never forget that. In these times we, we see sin abounding. Horrific things are happening. Unmentionable things are happening. And we may be tempted to think that the devil has taken over. But don't you think that that is so? Don't give way to such a blasphemy. For God is still upon the throne. And he has the devil as it were, upon a leash, and will not loose him until God's time comes. When we look at those men who were the foreshadowings of the Antichrist, we look at very wicked men. Pharaoh was a wicked man, a very wicked man. When we look at Cain, when we look at Goliath, when we look at Judas and many, many others that we see something of in the word of God, we see in them the worst side of humanity. And they were evil men. And it's easy for us to therefore conclude that if these, were, these evil men were but foreshadows of the Antichrist, what a terrible person the Antichrist is going to be. And undoubtedly he is going to be a very terrible person. We could turn to Daniel, we could turn to Revelation, and we could see the animals God used to depict the character of the Antichrist. Ferocious animals. Ferocious animals. Each one of which strikes fear and terror into the heart of man. And God wasn't exaggerating when he likened uh, the Antichrist unto a bear and unto a creature beyond description in its horror. God wasn't exaggerating. The Antichrist will be a most dreadful and wicked and vile individual. And we must, as it were, prepare ourselves for that. For that. Now in each foreshadowing that we look at in the scriptures, it's like, as it were, that occasion when a volcano erupts. The volcano has been there for centuries and every so often it does erupt and out of its depths there comes uh, this burning, flaming, molten fire that is a revelation of what it is that lies down there in the depths unseen normally by human eyes. But on those occasions when there is an eruption of the volcano, the world is reminded of the horrors that lie beneath the surface. And each time there was uh, an eruption by the darkness of hell's wickedness in the form of some of the characters we're looking at tonight, we'll be looking at Pharaoh. When, when there was this erupting, 
We are reminded of the darkness that lies beneath the surface of the human heart. The human heart. What darkness there is there. When you lift your newspaper and you read of some crime of, uh, that, that chills your very being. And of late, I think particularly of the horrible deaths that so many little children have been put to. Just remember this, that here we have a reflection of the, 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 the corrupt and the depraved spirit of man. If we say these things were never done in the past, it's not because the inclination, it's not because the, the possibility of such things being done in the past, did not exist and that something has happened to humanity of, in recent times to make it what it is today as is revealed in these terrible crimes. No, that's not the case. Today we have the erupting of the volcano that has always existed. Though at times there were eruptions in the past if you read the history of Rome if you read the history of Greece if you read the history of Babylon if you read the history of any number of so called civilizations there you will discover crimes unmentionable you know there are still many parts of the ancient city of Rome in which have, uh, there has been discovered antiquities from the early years of the Roman Empire, the, the, the very fullness of the Roman Empire, uh, and depicted in mosaics are scenes from uh, everyday life in the empire at that time. They are so horrible, so depraved, so wicked, the public is not allowed to see them. Even in a day when there's little shames anybody, there is still a, 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 a keeping the public away from such things, though I'm, I'm sure there is a relaxing of those restraints that uh, decorum demanded in, in times past. But there always were occasions in the history of humanity when vileness reached to fullness and like a volcano exploded and brought forth all its wickedness. And what I'm saying is that these men whose lives have been studied here and this man, Pharaoh, he is but an example of an erupting of the corruption that lies beneath the surface. We ought to bear this in mind that every one of us, every one of us, bears a likeness to the devil. The Antichrist is very much the son of the devil. But all of us, all of us, are children of the devil by nature. Listen to these words spoken by the Lord Jesus. John 8 and 44, you know them well. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now the Lord Jesus says to these men, you're of your father the devil. And there is a link between every son of Adam and the devil. There is a similarity of nature, a kinship of nature. The Lord Jesus again in a parable in Matthew chapter 13 uh, and the, the verse 38, he talks about the good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. 
Now, there was a time in our own experience when we were in submission to the devil. We followed him. We listened to him as, he, as a child would listen to a father. We obeyed him as a child would obey a father. That's what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2. And if tonight by the grace of God we're listening to the Lord, it's because of the work God did in us when we were made new creatures in Christ and old things passed away and all things become new but we're not completely delivered from that old satanic nature there abides within us the flesh and the flesh would have us rebel against God the flesh would recruit us and make us an agent of the devil that we might rebel against God. And, and, and if we enjoy a measure of victory over the devil, it's a result of God's grace and power in our life. And these things are necessary for us to ever bear in mind. When we look at Pharaoh, see something of yourself. That's what I'm saying. Don't dismiss him as someone who was so wicked and whose wickedness has no real bearing on me. My dear brother or sister, there is within us a spirit that if it were not for the grace of God, would go against God. It was seen in the life of David. It was seen in the life of Samson. It was seen in the life of Peter. You know the incidents in which those who loved the Lord and were saved and enjoyed the mercy and blessing of God nevertheless for a season sin overcame them and they were, were recruited to the cause of the devil and for the short time served the devil and brought great dishonor upon the Lord and greatly hindered the cause of God. So what I'm saying is, please, don't look at Pharaoh and all the other uh, individuals that have been the subject of studies in this series of, of, of Bible studies. Don't look at them in isolation, but look and tremble. Say, there go I but for the grace of God. And if it weren't for God's hand, upon me even from day to day I'm likely to wander off into those dark paths as well come let's quickly look then at Pharaoh let me tell you first of all that Pharaoh had no regard for the Israel of God and that's a feature of Antichrist We read in the Bible reading, the verse 8 of chapter 1, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Now don't for the th moment imagine that that means he never heard of Joseph. No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. It means that though he was aware of the history of Joseph and the role that he played in the affairs of Egypt in years gone by, he had no regard for Joseph. He had no love for Joseph. He did not place any honor upon Joseph. That's what it means. He knew not Joseph. You know, way back in Genesis chapter 15, God had told his people that of the time that they would spend in Egypt and what it would be like. Genesis chapter 15, the verse 13 reads, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed 
shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict, afflict them 400 years. That's the length of time that the nation that had sprung from the loins of Jacob and his children spent in Egypt in affliction. Now, you're always learning, at least I'm always learning. And I had to learn something as I looked at this passage of scripture. When I read in verse 8 of chapter 1, and there arose a new king over Egypt, that's not the Pharaoh who was drowned in the sea. That's not that Pharaoh. Because quite a number of years would take place between this Pharaoh referred to in verse 8 and the events that took place at the time of the first Passover. Moses was 80 years of age at the time God caused him to go in and demand of Pharaoh that he let the children of Israel go. And this Pharaoh here lived just before the birth of Moses. Now I know that our own good queen was marking a very lengthy reign there not so long ago. But I can't imagine a Pharaoh reigning for 80 years. And still after 80 years being a lively individual ready to jump into a chariot and lead his army out after Israel. No, we should bear in mind that 400 years was the period of the persecution of Israel. But it wasn't 400 years of intense persecution of the level that we see at the end of the 400 years. There was 400 years of animosity. 400 years in which the Pharaoh, the, rather the Egyptian, looked upon the Hebrew uh, 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 with a degree of covetousness and dislike. But over that 400 year period, it intensified and it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew in intensity. Uh, and Doubtless life was made difficult for the Hebrews until we reach the arrival, the ascendancy of this Pharaoh mentioned here in chapter 1 of Exodus and the verse 8 who had an intense hatred, no regard for Joseph and what he had done under God for his forefathers and he gave vent to a bitter hatred of the Israelite people. He had no regard whatsoever for the benefits that Egypt had gained uh, under the ministrations of Joseph. He had no, no regard. If you go back in, in your Bible to <laughs> Genesis uh, and the chapter 45, you have the climax of the wonderful story of Joseph. It's a, it's a most dramatic story, you know, of the brethren coming down and Joseph knowing them, but they don't know him. And he uh, plays them off one again another and, uh, and uh, puts on the image of uh, a most threatening individual. And you know the story. But then there comes a time in the verse 1 of chapter 45 of Genesis that Joseph could not refrain himself before them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And what is significant is the words of Joseph in verse 3 onward. I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? 
And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. God did this. And the life that was preserved was, of course, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Egyptians. The brothers, the family of Joseph, uh, entered into the benefits, of course, too, uh, of God's great mercy. But it was a mercy that was centered upon Egypt. But this Pharaoh cared for none of these things. He dismissed what God had done uh, from his mind and from his heart. And he took up uh, an attitude toward the descendants of Joseph, the descendants of Jacob, that was one of great bitterness. You know, God's people in this world have benefited this world greatly. God's people, since the dawn of time, have been as Joseph's. They have been those who have blessed the generation in which they have lived. Though the world cares nothing for it. The world has its attitude toward the Christian that was the attitude of Pharaoh towards Joseph. Didn't value what Joseph had done. Dismissed what Joseph had done. And the world cares nothing for the works of the Christian, the influences of the Christian. God may call the Christian the light of the world. He may call the Christian the salt of the world and thereby indicating the benefits that the Christian brings to the world. But the world itself places no such value upon the affairs of God's people. They have been a preservative. They have been a means of blessing. And the, the, the stories abound in scripture of, of those whose influence among the ungodly round about them proved to be a mighty blessing. A mighty blessing. And yet the world in general cared for none of these things. Pharaoh saw the Hebrews as a threat. He didn't see them as a benefit. He didn't look upon them and see the kindness of God that was manifested to Egypt. No, he saw them as a threat. He says in, in, in Exodus, we read it surely, and I'm sure you noted it, his carnal thinking. Verse 9, he said unto his people, Behold, the, chil the people of the children of Israel are more and more mightier than, than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. You see, they were already slaves. He saw here the possibility that they might escape should there arise a situation of war and the Israelites line up with the enemy and use the opportunity to escape out of Egypt. He saw them as a threat. He saw them as a threat. That's how the world has ever looked upon the Christian. I was reading just today <clears throat> of the news that came uh, to Herod that one king of the Jews was born in Bethlehem and he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Why should such a glorious announcement trouble men? Because men love their sin. Men love their sin. And the gospel preaching still troubles men. You only have to go out into the street and open your Bible and lift up your voice and begin to preach the gospel and immediately you'll have someone curse you. They haven't listened to a word you've said. They, they, they have absolute, absolutely not analyzed anything you've said, but the animosity is there already. Springs forth. Because the world has no time for the child of God, irrespective of what good the child of God may have brought to the world. So it was with Pharaoh. 
So it was with Pharaoh. He planned the eradication of the Hebrews, the killing of the male children. That, that, that entailed the destruction of the nation. The nation would die. Inevitably, the nation would die. He didn't plan to send his army and slaughter everybody right away because that would have hurt his economy. He depended on the Israelite people to work in his fields, etc., etc., etc. He would be hurting himself were he to do that, but he could reduce their strength and their power and the Finally, at, at an acceptable pace, eradicate them all together. This is the craft and the cunning of the devil at work. This is, the, this is what he was doing. He was going to eradicate them. Same spirit was manifested uh, in the plans and the, the desires of, of Hitler and many more before him. And the Antichrist who is yet to come. He'll, he'll desire the same thing. He'll desire the same thing. Pharaoh had no regard for the Israel of God. No regard for the Israel of the people that God loved. He hated. He hated. Then secondly, he had no regard for the God of Israel. If he had no regard for the children of Israel, the Israel of God. He certainly had no regard for the God of Israel. In chapter 5, <clears throat> in the verse 2, we have come forward now some 80 years, I might say, and here is the Pharaoh who is on the throne when God sends Moses in with God's command. Verse 1 of chapter 5, there, afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice, to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Now, the personage has changed. We're looking at a different man from the man in chapter 1 and the verse 8. But the office is the same. It's the king of Egypt. And the spirit that was in the king of Egypt in chapter 1 has developed. And there's a greater animosity toward God and the people of God in this Pharaoh. In this Pharaoh. And he says, who is the Lord? There's a spirit of defiance here. There's a spirit of disobedience here. And both combined breed deception. Pharaoh because, because he's ignorant of God, is ignorant of himself, ignorant of his own limitations. He thought he could defy God. He thought he could reject the command of God. He thought he was powerful enough to do that. And he thought he was powerful enough to do that because he didn't know God. When a man comes to understand who God is, there is immediately accompanying that understanding a knowledge concerning himself. It is only as we see God that we see what we are. When we see his greatness, we see our nothingness. <laughs> How often in the scriptures do you find those who by God's mercy are brought before God and permitted to see something of God's glory and God's power. And immediately they sense their own 
iniquity, their own uncleanness, their own weakness, their own nothingness. And they find themselves thinking of themselves as dust and ashes. Dust and ashes. Job. You remember what Job said regarding this matter in chapter 42, closing up of the book of Job. <clears throat> Job chapter 42, and in mercy God has begun to graciously deal with Job, speaking to his heart and revealing to him just how things are. And, and, and Job, in the light of, of this knowledge of God that is granted to him, says in the chapter 42 in the verse 5 I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear but now mine eye seeth thee wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes as he is given by God an intimate acquaintance of God's glory, he sees himself as nothing. Now he was ready to defend himself before his friends. His friends weren't wise in the accusations, of course, they brought against Job. But Job was ready to defend himself and uphold his integrity. But when he sees God, <coughs> he realizes that he is nothing and he's nobody. And he repents in dust and ashes. And Pharaoh, because he's totally ignorant of God and has no regard for God and no knowledge of God, He's defiant. He's defiant. Blinded to God, he's defiant of God. And says those words that, if, if words mean anything, denote defiance. Who is the Lord? What a dreadful question. That I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And all that spirit is born out of ignorance. Born out of blindness. He had no regard for the God of Israel. You know... The Bible makes it clear that man, like Pharaoh, is blind to the power and glory of God. Pharaoh, this Pharaoh, had presented to him many displays of God's power and majesty. And indeed he was made to feel the greatness of God's power and majesty. But still he defied God. Still he defied God. And in so doing he was not the first. Nor will he be the last. Many have had wonderful privileges yet they still defy God. I think of our own nation. There is no nation under heaven outside of the nation of Israel that have had presented to them more evidences of God's greatness and God's power and God's mercy and God's love than this nation Visitation after visitation of revival. Mercy upon mercy upon mercy. Have been visited upon the 
people of these islands. And yet today there is an utter defying of God and all that is revealed in his word concerning him. There was a decision taken yesterday regarding membership of the European Union. But whatever the merits of that decision may be, and I just wonder, are there any merits in the decision? It has to be said that never once, never once, and I think I'm correct in saying this, was ever God's view, God's word, God's truth put forward as a reason in this debate. God was never mentioned. God was never mentioned. We could sum up the whole argument that was presented by both sides. And that was, if you heed us, you'll be better off. There's more money for you. There's more prosperity for you. And the greed of man uh, was played upon by both parties. And it was that which decided this issue. And there were more people, it would appear, who decided that we would be better off and our greed would be satisfied to a greater degree by getting out of the EU. But God never featured in it all. This nation has forgotten all about God. If it is said of Pharaoh that he said, I know not the Lord, then it, it may be said of the United Kingdom that it says the same. I know not the Lord. Why should I consider what he has to say? Why should I take into account anything he has done? Oh, we should tremble for our land. We should tremble for our land. Many, many Christians will find in the decision that has been taken uh, that which will encourage them and, and cause them to rejoice. But I wonder. In truth, it reveals to us a nation now that makes decisions, momentous decisions. Decisions will, that will have an impact undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly upon uh, generations to come. But they're prepared to make those decisions without a thought of God. Without a thought of God. Experts of every form and Fashion and shape were consulted, but nobody was asked, would you open the Bible and tell us what it has to say? What does God has to say? No, that, that never entered into the thinking of those engaged in this debate or into the thinking of the vast, vast, vast majority of people who listened and decided on the basis of what it is they heard in that debate. God has no place in the, 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 the thinking of people today. Man, man today is blind to God, just like Pharaoh. Blind to God. Despite all that God has done in the shaping of our history that God has wrought, there's no time, no place, no consideration for God. So it will be in the future, men and women. You know, God is going to put on displays of his power. Unseen since the days of Pharaoh. The only difference being that I think the future displays of God's power will be even more marvelous and wonderful than that which Pharaoh and his people witnessed. I'll not take the time tonight, but you only have to go to the book of the Revelation. And you know, what you read there in chapters like chapter 9, chapter 11, will actually take place. 
there will take place, that shaking of the earth and the visitation of it by plagues and judgments that are so out of the ordinary that we're inclined to dismiss them and the record of them as some form of exaggeration on the part of God, but don't make that mistake. What is recorded there will happen exactly as it is recorded. And God will display again his mightiness, his majesty, his power in this earth. And it will make no difference to men. In one particular place we read of men visited by the judgments of God to such a degree they gnawed their tongues in agony just you think of that just you think of that what pain it is that causes a man to chew his tongue in agony in distress and yet, it is said that those who do that repent not of their sin. They repent not of their sin. Their defiance of God is greater than the pain, the immeasurable pain that they are enduring at the hand of God. Oh, do read those chapters that I have mentioned chapter 9 chapter 11 chapter 16 read them carefully read them reverently and see what God will one day visit this earth with and yet the spirit that was manifested in Pharaoh will be manifested again amongst men generally because it's the day of the Antichrist it's the day in which the one who is imbued with the spirit that was seen it to some degree in Pharaoh, he's imbued with it to a fullness. And there's a mighty defiance of God in the dominion over which he rules. Let me say, as I come to the conclusion of our, our study that Pharaoh's persecuting of the people of God initiated amongst the Hebrews a seeking of God a seeking of God By the wickedness of Pharaoh, God prepared his people to be transported out of Egypt into the promised land. You remember how at the beginning of, of, of Exodus, God says, I have heard the sighing and the groaning of my people, and I am come down to deliver them and come down to deliver them so that sighing that brokenness that crying after God which was provoked within the ranks of the Hebrew people by the persecutions of Pharaoh was that brought about God's intervention it brought about God's intervention now why I say that is because that will be repeated that will be repeated at the end of this age the counterpart of Pharaoh will so squeeze the Israelite people that it will bring about a 
crying unto him for his deliverance and for his help. Those who have long ignored God. And let me tell you, during the 400 years in which the Hebrews were in Egypt, they, they did neglect God. And I would say that spiritually and religiously, they, they had adopted much of the lifestyle of the Egyptians and had worshipped the gods of the Egyptians. And God was working out his purpose to bring them back again to himself using the hand, the persecuting hand of Pharaoh to bring that about. And the Israel that we know today, the descendants of Abraham in the world today are a godless people, <coughs> totally integrated with the wickednesses of the nations of the world, defiant of God, promoters of every form of ungodliness. And to bring them out of that and to promote repentance amongst them, a remnant of them, God is going to use the hand of Pharaoh's successor, the Antichrist, and the persecutions that he will bring upon Israel to bring about that cry. Uh, I follow in my Bible readings the timetable put together by Robert Murray McShane, and every chance I get, I advertise it. I believe every Christian should use it. I believe that you can see the hand of God upon that man when he, doubtless prayerfully, compiled that calendar of Bible readings. Because I have time and time again read away at the beginning of the Bible and then gone to the corresponding chapter in the New Testament and found a wonderful link. A link that no man, no matter how smart and wise and intelligent he was, could ever organize of himself. And of late I've been reading through the Psalms. And many of the Psalms picture the cries of Israel in that day of persecution. And they're crying unto God against the wickedness of their enemy. And they're talking about, prophetically, the psalmist is talking about Antichrist and, and the terrors that he's reigning upon the Israel of God. And they're crying out to God that he might intervene, that he might save them, that he might deliver them. And you can see that spirit in many, many of the psalms and in the prophecies too like those of Jeremiah and Isaiah, you, you see how God indicates that he will turn the hearts of his people unto himself again by the ministrations of the cruelties of the Antichrist. And what happened back in the days of Pharaoh, it'll happen again. It'll happen again. Out of the cruelties of Pharaoh, there came the Passover and the deliverance of Israel. And out of the cruelties of the Antichrist, the persecutions of Israel, there will come a seeking of him by a remnant. And the Lord Jesus will descend once again to deliver his people. I am come down, he said to Moses, to deliver them. And one day he will come down to deliver his people. Most wonderfully, most gloriously. It's true, of course, he's coming for his church. But his church must never, never forget. Must never forget that the Lord Jesus is also coming to save the remnant of the nation of Israel. And unite them with his church. <coughs> See that picture there in the story 
of Pharaoh. As Pharaoh perished in the Red Sea, so it will be with Antichrist. So it will be with Antichrist. How wonderfully on that day God will work out so many elements and branches of his purpose. The saving of Israel. The smashing of Antichrist. All taking place in the one action on the part of God. Listen to what we read in Exodus 14. The verses 24 to 28. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drove, drove them heavily so that the Egyptians said let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians and the Lord said unto Moses stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians upon their chariots and upon their horsemen and Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. So it will be in the day of the Lord. It happened in the morning watch. Bless God, there's a day coming. And in the dawn of it, there will be a delivering of his ancient people. And a destroying of Antichrist and all his forces. And a new day indeed will dawn. Oh, search the scriptures, dearly, dear Christian. Study these matters out, for God has been pleased to record them for your edification, for your good, and for your encouragement. May the Lord bless his word. Brother Paul, will you just close with the closing hymn, please? The Lord bless you.